Simon, good to get you on Real Vision. If you can give a bit of background about yourself so people know who you are and and, uh, and then we can start digging into some things. Sure, yeah. So um, my journey in uh, finance and crypto has been a 20-year journey. Um, when I started in economics, um, started working in investment banking, worked as a stockbroker, then a market maker, then in corporate finance. Um, and then threw in the corporate towel in 2006 um, and started giving lectures on monetary reform. I joined a movement called the Monetary Reform Movement, which was a precursor to the Bitcoin. Started giving some lectures and got myself invited to the first Bitcoin conference. Um, wrote a book called Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust, uh, which was the first published book in the world to include Bitcoin. And um, now an investor in about 100 different companies in the industry from Coinbase to Kraken, Bitstamp, Bitfinex and many others. Um, and uh, founded a platform called banktothefuture.com, which is, allows investors to invest in the equity of companies in the Bitcoin and crypto and fintech industry. So talk to me about discovering your journey of discovering Bitcoin and then starting to think about the space. and. And then we'll move into the investments that you made and some of that stuff. But I'd love to know how the hell you got into it. Yeah, sure. So um, it was when I was writing the book, Bank to the Future, um, I was really going geeky and diving deep into many of the problems in banking. Um, I even started reading like bank chart app papers for the Bank of England and uh, various what, other things. What were, the main, what were the main problems you were seeing when you were looking at that? Um, so I summarized it into three main problems with banking that we were trying to find a solution for. Um, the first is that when you deposit your money with a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner of your money, um, which uh, really subjects it to bail-ins and other things. That, uh, the second was that when you, they become the legal owner of your money, um, they can get in the way of your money, firstly, um, from you spending it as you choose. Um, and secondly, they are redirecting the flow of 97% of the entire money supply uh, by where they choose to issue loans using your deposit as collateral. Um, so they can actually end up you know, creating bubbles in property markets um, because just simply because they prefer it as an asset class in terms of risk reward. Um, so this uh, becomes a problem where they're spending your money. And then finally, it was really digging into how money is actually created and how different it was taught in economics. Um, and the end conclusion I came to is that uh, in economics, they were teaching this thing called a multiplier effect. Um, and then when I tried to find out how the multiplier effect actually worked in practicality, um, it turned out the banks were just simply creating as much money as they were willing to lend. Um, and there wasn't much of a fraction, there wasn't any real reserves uh, to this term called fractional reserve banking. Um, so it was the realization that because banks are dictating the flow of money, they are actually creating a digital currency every time they issue a loan. It's a digital representation of the pound, the euro or the dollar. Um, and they actually invented digital currencies. So. Um, because all money is backed by debt, I concluded that it's actually a, the largest regulated Ponzi scheme um, in history. Um, and so really that drove me to meet, I met a guy called uh, Johnny Bitcoin who attended one of my um, conferences and he actually, he actually sold his house um, to move into a squat in Old Street in London um, with uh, some of the early Bitcoin developers. Um, and uh, I was so intrigued by it that uh, the, one of the persons, uh, one of the activists that was out there uh, living in that squad organized the first Bitcoin conference in the world in Prague um, and invited me to speak. And from then on, I realized uh, what these people are creating which was year, actually... Which year was this? Uh, so I started writing the book in 2010 and then spoke at the conference in 2011. Right. Um, yeah, that was the realization that actually what these guys are creating. I was very skeptical about whether it would succeed, um, but I thought I bought my first Bitcoin, which was a physical Bitcoin, um, and that had five Bitcoins on it for twenty-five dollars or pounds, I think it was at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I realized that this is money you can own, money that you can spend, and money that doesn't reward people for taking on debt and actually rewards the saver because of its scarcity and fixed money supply. So I actually saw it as a problem 
I was trying to solve, which is how do you create a bank where you can own your money, spend your money, um, and actually, uh, you know, have a money supply that sounds money. And so that, that's why it intrigued me and I guess took it a bit more seriously than your typical banker at the time. And what did you think of the value? How were you thinking of Bitcoin at the time? You were just thinking it was a transactional currency? I mean, what, what was your... Because everyone goes through the journey that they think they understand what it is. They grasp onto that. And then you go through the journey of realizing you don't know anything about it. And then you come to the other side, figuring out some of it. So where did you start with what you thought it was? And how's that changed? Yeah, so I first thought this is the technology for a non-fractional reserve bank. That was my first understanding because that was the world that I was living in at the time. How do you create a non-fractional reserve bank? Um, you know, I was dealing with regulators in the UK. I, we were trying to bank the bank to the future. We were actually trying to create a non-fractional reserve bank. And at the time, there was no concept of this challenger bank that came later. Um, and at the time, you had to have the, the regulators told us um, you're going to need uh, 30 million uh, in reserves just to get started at the Bank of England. You're going to need 30 million to build out your infrastructure. Um, you're going to have to step down as CEO and hire somebody that's actually been a CEO of a bank. Um, and we were very disappointed, you know, um, disjointed by the process. So Bitcoin to me was, okay, here's how we can create. Same, I actually went through the same process in 2010 try to set up a bank both in Singapore and in the US for the same reasons and it and just gave up because it was just a nightmare to do. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that about your story. But yeah, so we and I remember the regulators at the time, they just said, sorry, we just wouldn't simply give someone like you a banking license was the word um, at the time. So uh, yeah, we, we, we found Bitcoin. We thought it was a, a non-fractional reserve bank. We decided to invest in the industry to try and support it. Um, we, they, at, the, at that time, we were the first company in the industry. Mt. Gox had just been launched. Um, there was no real price. It wasn't speculative at that time. In fact, um, this is when Mt. Gox had early launched. Um, and the price during that week crashed from $30 to $3. Um, so we had a 90% correction in a period of one, one day. Um, at the time. So really, there wasn't, no one was speculating. Um, it was really, everyone was there in a mission of us versus the banks um, and just trying to create, or or they were cypherpunks cipher that just really were trying to create censorship resistant money. And that was, and that wasn't even a word then, that word came later, but, you know, words to this effect. There was no real, you know, concept of store of value or uh, whether this would actually you know whether the scarcity would um, become make it hard money that came a little bit later um, but yeah the first was for me non-fractional reserve bank the others were a way to circumvent the banking system um, and uh, you know really seeing it as a way of transacting rather than a way of actually storing wealth or, or trying to you know store value and how did your understanding of it evolve and how did that lead you to start investing in some of these startups in the space i think the journey so firstly we, we started investing in the startups because our bitcoin did so well that i wanted to um you know uh, help other companies and um this is when we actually pivoted bank to the future which was going to be a non-fractional reserve bank to being an online funding platform um, and uh, we were creating, we were, we were lobbying the regulators. Uh, the UK regulator at the time was called the FSA. It's now called the FCA. Um, and uh, we managed to get some changes which allowed for small amounts of investing online. And those changes allowed us after about three years to um, uh, allow many of the early crypto companies to fund through our platform. So we did the seed round for like Kraken, uh, Bitstamp, um, and uh, shapeshift many of these earlier companies. Um, and through because we were actually working, rather than focusing on non-fractional reserve banking, we started focusing on securities laws. Um, and uh, yeah, actually that was the work that President Obama picked up in 2012 that actually led to the Jobs Act and the changing of the 1933 um, securities laws. And that was really from that three years of work that we were doing in the UK at the time. And it, it just worked well, this online investing concept for securities online. 
Um, but yeah, the, the, in terms of the evolution, um, that's what made me starting to invest. I mean, Bitcoin just made us wealthy enough to want to do that. Our whole company didn't need venture capital because we um, invested in Bitcoin. Um, and uh, really, we just the 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 understanding evolved. Uh, I think when everyone had their story of being Bitcoin pizza guys. So the more Bitcoin we spent, the more we realized that we uh, in the future we just bought a hundred million dollar pizza or something like that, like Bitcoin pizza guy. Um, and everyone had their stories. Uh, you know, I remember many people like celebrating and selling out when they hit a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. Uh, these different milestones uh, and then really the rhetoric around hold on i'd rather just spend my money that's going to go down in value and keep my money that goes up in value uh, and then really the whole focus was around there is there is you know this is digital gold this is money that you want to keep um, this is money that rewards the saver and um, this is a wealth transfer um, you know for people that are exiting the traditional financial system um, and it just became a bigger and bigger movement uh, from there. Fascinating. Talk to me a bit about the, the, the platform you then created. Do people invest in the in individual shares or is it like a portfolio? How does that work? And how do people even, I mean, how did you even get people to invest in this stuff? I mean, nobody really knew what the hell this was. I'm yeah, sorry, it was really. It sounds ridiculous. Why well, invest in Kraken? Yeah, it was really, uh, yeah, the name, you know, just that, that was a reason not to invest just because of the name. Um, and now it's a household name that we just did a funding round of $4 billion. So, but yeah, at the time, there was no venture capitalist that was um, willing to invest in the industry. It was, you know, there were some very early stage ones, um, but the companies like Kraken were, you know, they, they just couldn't secure the funding because it was such an obscure industry. The regulations were so uncertain. You know, you had to pitch Bitcoin, then you had to pitch the company, then you had to pitch the regulations, and it was just too many hurdles to overcome. So when we created Bank to the Future, the, the first um, license when we were added to the FCA register was that we were allowed to work with UK companies only and secure, um, in, uh, pull together investments from UK investors only. Um, and there was no Bitcoin or fintech companies really. The peer-to-peer -peer lending was really becoming a thing at that time. So like the, the early peer-to-peer -peer lending companies like Zopa and Funding Circle uh, were coming to be. So fintech kind of became this thing. But Bitcoin was like this, this obscure niche within a niche that no one really cared about. Um, and so really we just, we built a community and uh, we, we it, it was when, one of the first companies that we funded through the platform was an investment company called Bitcoin Capital. And it was myself and Max Kaiser. Um, Max Kaiser was the first to actually cover Bitcoin on public television. Um, and then that created, you know, Max Kaiser kind of became uh, this, this, this place where every time you mentioned it on TV, the price went crazy. Um, and so, the, yeah, we set up this Bitcoin Capital and we just simply pulled together a bunch of money that we raised through Bank to the Future. Um, we invested one third of it in Bitcoin mining um, and the rest of it we invested in companies like Kraken and Bitstamp. Um, how, and how, did you how did you choose those companies? Um, again, because you're, they not were, yeah, you're not based in Silicon Valley. You don't know any of those guys. You know, you're, you know, you're an ex-market maker. So how the hell do you figure out who Kraken is and Coinbase and all of this? Well, because I, you know, because we were so encaptured after that first Bitcoin conference that it was very easy within, I mean, nowadays, you know, my full-time job is to try and keep up with this stuff and I can't keep up with it. Um, but at the time, within a couple of weeks, you would be able to know, you'd know all the CEOs of all the companies. You'd be able to communicate with the whole community on the Bitcoin talk forum. Um, and it was a very small niche community. So it was very easy to get involved with at the time. Um, there was only so many people you could you could know, and there were only a few companies. So our first strategy was let's just get all the companies and try and help them. Our first was, you know, uh, BitPay um, was invested in through Max Kaiser's fund, um, and where it really kicked off for us, where it changed from a niche where we were trying to support the industry, was when we invested in Bitcoin mining at the right time. Um, we were paying our investment company was paying out. Bitcoin dividends every single day. We paid out thousands of Bitcoin um, to all of our investors. 
Um, and then suddenly Bitcoin went from its uh, pump, you know, after the Cyprus um, bail-ins um, and towards the, you know, the before Mt. Gox crash, where it had its first major bubble um, to $1,000. Um, and we were sat on the largest community of wealthy high net worth investors that made money through Bitcoin. Uh, we did the same through Ethereum. So a lot of those Bitcoin people, we put, we created a, a security called the Ether Mining Back Security. Um, and we paid out tens of thousands of Ether to all of the Bitcoin investors that made money through Bitcoin. Um, and uh, then that went to, you know, this was under a dollar at the time and it went up to 1,400 in its peak. Um, so, you know, we, uh, uh, our community came from um, creating investment products, our investors becoming wealthy, and then diversifying into other deals. So um, those were just our, our foundations. You know, we did the first security token with Bitfinex after their hack in 2016, where you could convert a token into equity. And really, we just always been, because we were dealing with securities, we weren't circumventing securities laws. We were doing everything through equity. Um, so when we explained it to regulators, yeah, it was a bit edgy. We were trying to explain Bitcoin, but really, this is just a security. It's equity. Um, and so therefore, um, and because we took the proactive approach of trying to get on the right side of innovation and the right side of regulations, um, and we did it through traditional products, uh, many of the other companies were trying to circumvent securities laws by saying a token's not a security or, um, you know, because it's a cryptocurrency, it's money. Um, and no one, you know, these types of things, they all got in trouble. Um, but we were just doing plain vanilla securities that were investing. The, in, how, what did they think about the mining then? Because that must have been something that blew their minds, right? Because you're also, you're not only investing the equity of these companies, but you're also mining for Bitcoin and Ether. Well, again, we were just um, raising money for an, an, an investment vehicle. And then making investments. And one of those investments was in mining. And we just happened to pay rather than, you know, do like uh, structures like cloud mining, which evolved later. Uh, we were just paying out a dividend every day in Bitcoin through the platform and because we could automate the technology. We could pay out real time dividends and we could pay every single day and we could pay in a cryptocurrency. So, you know, that 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 was really it was a, a few deals in the foundational. We started investing, and then on our platform, we allow everyone to co-invest with us. So, when when the VCs started coming in, you know, um, we would get a, a company where the VCs uh, we'd built relationships with all the companies in crypto already. They were just starting to get their VC funding, and then they would allocate some to our platform. We put together a special structure, and um, our investors globally. At this time, we started working with more and more securities laws. Um, and we were just one one step ahead of all the trends and trying to stay ahead of the compliance, um, you know, and then before our industry got disrupted with ICOs and all these other things that came later. So those early investors, including yourself, how did you deal with the price swings? Did you trade a position? Did you, you know, when it goes up to a thousand and you bought it at nothing, you know, it's very difficult not to sell. How did you deal with all of that? So we weren't actually like trading for them or investing in cryptocurrencies. It was always equity. Um, and when we did things like mining, we were just paying all of the mining yeah, you, um, out to all the investors. You yourself and was, would have been, you held Bitcoin yeah. over that period. Yeah, me as an individual. Yeah, I just um, very early on started to appreciate because of my belief about uh, money and the problems with, uh, you know, um, the debt creation and money system. Um, I took a speculation and I spent it as I went along. But for me, when someone says to me, um, do you want to sell your Bitcoin? I hear, do you want to buy dollars? And my answer is, I'll buy some dollars or I'll buy some pounds or I'll buy some euros, depending on where I am. Um, but only the amount that I need for my living expenses. I'm not going to save in an asset class that's being um, that's going to go down in value, um, a currency. So for me, Bitcoin was, we started to really develop this understanding that this could be a digital scarcity um, and this could actually be uh, a but better version. Had you version not, had you not questioned that when it falls 90% three times in a row, you know, it's very difficult to say it's a store of value and see it fall 90% and then only again to recover and go much further. I mean, that's pretty, it's a psychologically difficult. Um, and it was it was very difficult, um, but the the 
the way that our company was structured is we always, so because we had a combination of fiat currencies and crypto, so we get a commission off every investment and many of our investments were made um, with Bitcoin, um, but other investments were made with dollars and we always had enough dollars to never sell our Bitcoin. Um, so we always saw it as as long as we got enough dollars to meet our operational costs as a company and me as an individual, as long as I've got enough dollars to meet my living expenses and lifestyle, which was very frugal at the time, um, then I don't need to sell those bitcoins. Um, and there were times when it was really scary. You know, um, it was very questionable whether it would succeed. But after seeing my $30 bitcoin crash to $3, and then my $1,000 Bitcoin crashed to $250, and then my $20,000 Bitcoin crashed to um, $3,000, I became okay holding until my $100,000 Bitcoin crashes to $30,000. So where do you think, before we dig in more about the space and other stuff, where do you think Bitcoin's going? Does your thesis still hold up? I'm sure it still does. And therefore, where do you think it goes? Just in value terms, and then we'll talk about yeah. ecosystem terms later. So on my YouTube channel in 2011, I uploaded a video called The Great Depression of 2020, which just suddenly emerged because 2020 became a significant year. I had no idea there was going to be a pandemic, but um, we were following the, the economic trends. And um, I, I've still got all the archives from even that first Bitcoin conference I spoke at. I'm really glad that I recorded it, uploaded it to my YouTube channel, had very few views. Um, but now it's become an important archive of the journey. But uh, the yeah, the the trends that we see again, Bitcoin um, has utility for three reasons, and this is what I see it as: any scenario where you need to own your own money. And so when we saw pockets of adoption, like the first adoption, it was some of the early adoption was when you know we had the Cyprus bank bail-ins. And we were able to compare and contrast, oh, by the way, did you not know that if your money's at a bank, you don't actually own it? There's this federal insurance that thing. That was the light bulb moment. I was living in Spain at the time. I saw the Cyprus bail-ins, and that was the light bulb moment for Bitcoin for me, for that reason. Exactly. Um, then the second utility is money that you can spend without a middle person. And the light bulb moment for me was when we saw that um, – a perfectly legitimate legal um, company, WikiLeaks, um, was because of its political exposure, because governments don't necessarily want them doing what they do, um, and because of its impact on freedom of speech, uh, they were blockaded by the entire banking system, Bank of America, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, um, but they were able to transact in Bitcoin. So any scenario, the second utility, is any scenario whereby you don't want a middle person in your money. So, you know, I believe in law enforcement doing their job, but I don't think that we've, we've now hit upon a time in our day and age, ever since 9-11, uh, whereby the government have relied upon the financial system to do all the policing um, of, uh, of money laundering. Now, the, if you can create a, a situation where, law where an individual um, can spend and you can attach uh, you know, an immutable record. So if you're committing crime with that, then this immutable record of you transacting, if they ever attach your identity to those transactions, um, is there. So it's not a good, it's for me, you know, using Bitcoin to commit crime, like we've had all the Twitter hacks and stuff um, this week. It's just a really bad idea because we saw with Silk Road that eventually if they can connect, connect your identity um, you don't have any plausible deniability or any of these things um, because of that record. So what it does is it takes the middle companies out from policing. Now, if you if you hold Bitcoin at an exchange or with a, a counterparty or a custodian, then the traditional financial system still prevails. They own that money, they can spend that money, and they can do fractional reserve, as we saw with Mt. Gox, where they had more Bitcoin than Bitcoin um, on deposit. But so that you know, the second case is people understanding that when you can spend your money, take out that middle person, um, then it goes back to you being a law-abiding system citizen and law enforcement doing their job. Um, the third was, uh, I think, the case that we're seeing right now, which is where for the first, for a, first in a long time, people are actually questioning, can we really, really print all this money? Can the Federal Reserve really create this much money? And if they can, 
why are we actually even paying tax? And people are asking these interesting questions. You know, if they could pay, if they could just do that and it works, um, why can't they just do that? And, you know, um, and so really when you have a use case of people realizing, um, like you're seeing in countries like with hyperinflation and various other things, um, people are starting to realize, well, there is value in digital scarcity and gold, you know, has traditionally played that role. And I, 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 you know, I think gold has a place in everyone's portfolio. But what do you do when you're in a lockdown scenario? Planes don't work. And because of gold, you have to store it in Switzerland or in, um, in Singapore uh, because it's dangerous to store it at your own place. Bitcoin creates an alternative to that, whereby at that point you want your Bitcoin. Um, and so really there's these, these different use cases of owning your own money, spending your own money and digital scarcity. And at different times in the last 10 years, things show up that make people realize that they're important. We talked about Cyprus bail-ins. Um, there was demonetization in India where people were queuing outside with um, you know, we invested in Unocoin and different um, companies that were doing Bitcoin in India. And, you know, they quadrupled their volume on the exchange just because um, India decided that they're going to make certain notes illegal. Then you had to digitize it through the banking system and you had to queue outside with your life savings in a cash, in, you know, in a, in a cash and gold driven economy, um, you know, putting your life at risk and, and then the bank running out of notes and all sorts of stuff. So, it's these use cases, and today is another one of those use cases because I personally believe that we're entering, we've already started, we won't know whether it's defined as the Great Depression of 2020, but I think we're in it. Um, and I think we're headed to a 1944-style monetary renegotiation. And I think people are going to realize that, you know, the largest central banks in the world are going to get a seat at that monetary renegotiation, probably because of how much gold they have. But I think smaller central banks are actually going to look at Bitcoin as a play to try and make a country isometric bet in order to try and get more power. Um, so I think it's 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 really interesting time that we're seeing right now. And so you remain very bullish on the Bitcoin price overall and its utility function increasing as well. Um, yeah, I think every year Bitcoin has got more useful. Um, I don't think many of the different use cases hasn't made it more useful, but the same use case that it started with, um, more and more people need that over time. So I think the utility goes there. And the only way that they can, you know, there's only 21 million Bitcoin, 18 and a half million of them have already been mined. Um, and so the only place to get those Bitcoin is to pay a higher price for them um, from people that need to sell them. So uh, it's, it's digital scarcity. It's yeah. supply and demand. So talk to me a bit about the rest of the space. How did you start getting in, involved in the rest of the space? Because the Bitcoin thing is very specific. You know, you've gone through that journey. You had a specific problem in mind. This was the solution you saw. Made total sense. But then you, you've been involved at a broader sense in the space too, in the whole kind of digital asset space. Talk me through that journey a bit as well, because that's interesting. Firstly, you know, I see Bitcoin. Uh, I haven't seen anything that competes with Bitcoin. Um, I still think that nothing competes. Um, there's only one shot that we have as society today at achieving digital sound money, and I think that's Bitcoin. Um, but that doesn't stop us from having lots of interesting conversations. And one of the conversations that happened in the early days of Bitcoin was, well, can't we put um, assets um, uh, you know, on the Bitcoin blockchain? Um, and one of the people that was really picking up that conversation was Vitalik, who created Ethereum. Um, and he was trying to create, uh, you know, it was called colored coins at the time. Um, and we were having this whole conversation around disrupting stock markets using assets that exist on top of Bitcoin. Um, and Vitalik was uh, actually just a journalist for Bitcoin magazine. Um, and he couldn't get the changes that he wanted. So... Uh, he started creating his own project and it was funded by the Bitcoin community, which was um, essentially you could chuck some of your Bitcoins into this project that you called Ethereum. Um, and they would, it was trying to cater for the different use cases. Um, at the time, it was really thought around as a decentralized Internet. Um, but later and where I think it reaches where it is today is uh, it, firstly, it had this, you know, this boom where people were creating tokens 
um, and people thought that they weren't securities, so they were circumventing securities laws, they're now called down when they realize that they're securities. And the, the interesting thing is in 2017, we got disrupted um, from the companies that we were funding. Uh, because no company in 2017, we had all of the, you know, we had many of the major companies signed to sell their equity through our platform. Um, and then suddenly we got a call from each and every one of them, sorry, I'm issuing a token. And all of our investors were saying, why would I want to invest in equity when I can make 10, 100 X in a, in 10 minutes um, on in these tokens? So um, literally we got disrupted by the companies that we were funding. Um, but then it all kind of went circular and people started to learn the value of equity again and um, a lot of the, the, that. Um, but yeah, the, the, so then all those tokens came along and people realized actually it doesn't circumvent securities laws. Um, and now we're getting this whole uh, decentralized finance space, um, which is really people searching for yield in interesting ways by converting their fiat into you know, um, what's called stable coins. And uh, uh, that came, that was an interesting one as well because we were shareholders in Bitfinex. And for about two years, Bit, the original vision behind Tether, which is the largest stable coin today, was just to try and make it easier for people to transact between exchanges. Um, and, you know, once you've onboarded into Fiat, you could then send the digital representation of Fiat. Um, and Bitfinex and Tether accidentally became the bank to the entire crypto industry because uh, these different exchanges came along and they realized, oh, we don't need banking. So Binance came along and said, hey, we don't even need banking. We can use Tether. Um, Bitfinex can become the bank. Um, and so suddenly billions started coming into these banks and Bitfinex became the bank of all of the, the crypto to crypto exchanges. Um, and they Binance became this huge growth story simply because they didn't have to deal with banking and they passed it all on to Tether. And, you know, so we had these really interesting growth stories as a result of that. But prior to that, Tether was just really, really boring. No exchange about, would use it. And what about the discussions people have about Tether and the fact that it's so opaque that nobody knows if it's fully backed and that kind of stuff? What's your view on that? So, yeah, I, I, you know, again, I, I, I try to give disclosures whenever I'm talking about a company. I am a shareholder of Bitfinex. Bitfinex is the, the management team that created Bitfinex are the same with Tether. Um, it was created at a time. Um, so firstly, it's, it's a banking problem. Um, Bitfinex and the whole, the whole industry, if I could put one theme of what ha has held this industry back, it's been a banking problem, which is ironic trying to disrupt banking and banking becomes the thing that, that's been the most problematic side of it. Um, and so Tether has been, you know, once you start, you, you can you can have a few million in a bank, but once you start having billions in a bank, um, you start to get, you know, under the radar of, uh, you know, uh, these different banks. And then um, you have to then move money from one bank to the other. And then in order to try and transact and meet people's demands, because you reach the stage where you can't find a bank that will serve you. Um, and so Bitfinex and Tether uh, essentially had to deposit some of their money with what looked like a, 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 you know, a, a payment processing company. You could call it a shadow bank. Um, and the, you know, because of that, um, when, they got in, when the bank, the shadow bank got in trouble with the government, some of the money disappeared. Um, it was seized by government. So you've got money in a banking system that is seized by governments that is IOUs on stable coin, on a stable coin. So you have to get pretty innovative at this stage to try and overcome these problems, but it's all banking problems. Um, and uh, later other stable coins came along and they had the benefit of being launched at a time when banks understood this. Um, there was more regulatory structures that you could put in place. Um, but, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's a challenging thing um, and uh, they haven't been able to get that audit done. You know, I can't comment on it. I'm, I'm, I am a shareholder. I don't have inside information, um, but I know what's publicly available and it's been a, it's, they've been plagued by banking problems. They've now found a stable banking solution, um, but uh, they've still got to overcome these challenges. What are your thoughts on the DeFi space? Because it seems that I mean, there's, there's in some incredible yields going on, but I always assume that with incredible yields comes risk that people don't understand because usually the financial markets arbitrage it away pretty quickly. 
Well, how do you think about this DeFi space and, and what's where it is currently now? Yeah, so um, people often ask me like questions like this. What do you think of this coin? What do you think of DeFi? What do you think of these things? Um, and I think I think you said the right word is risk management. Um, so when I think about building a portfolio or investing in this industry, you've got Bitcoin and I see no competition. Um, and then I've got a bunch of things that I'm willing to do in order to try and receive greater returns. So I will take some of those Bitcoins. Most of them will be you know, where you own a private key and there's no counterparty risk. But what happens if I mess up myself? Um, I'll have some of them in custody because sometimes that might be the backup plan um, for you losing your, your key because you've got to learn this new methodology of storing wealth. Um, then I'll think of it like, well, I'll take about 10% of that maybe, you know, and I'll be willing to take counterparty risk by lending it um, to, you know, hedge funds that are actually putting up a lot of collateral and they're willing to pay high interest rates for your Bitcoin. Um, and it is collateralized. Um, but there is risk in that. You know, the, the risk is counterparty risk um, and you need to factor in these things. So how much of my Bitcoin am I willing to risk on that? Then I'll say to myself things like, well, there's this whole DeFi space emerging and it's impossible to keep up. Every week there's a new thing um, that you need to understand. But they tend to all be built upon Ethereum. So for me, having some Ethereum exposure gives you experience, exposure to all this stuff. Um, and then it's moving to different things like where you can stake it and receive returns and, um, you know, you can get some returns through DeFi. At the moment, the yields are incredibly high. But to me, it's going to normalize. There's, there's no such thing as, uh, you know, these really high yields forever. At the moment, it's gone from, you know, I think before this lockdown, I gave a presentation. There was about 350 million locked up in DeFi. And now it's gone to a billion just over this lockdown period. Um, that's going to that means that new fiat is entering the ecosystem, and therefore the opportunity for these higher yields can only diminish because you know you, you, everything's risk. You, you get higher returns because you're taking higher risk. And Ethereum is infinitely more risky than Bitcoin. If you believe, I subscribe to things like complexity theory, and complexity theory states the more complex something is, the more likely you are to have these unintended crazy events. And Ethereum has been full of them. And DeFi has been full of these crazy, crazy, unexpected black swan events. And that's why you get a higher return, because you've got to stomach it. So for me, investing in this space is about building many of the lessons from traditional finance and applying it to the, the Bitcoin industry. So you might be willing to gamble some of your money on the next Bitcoin killer, um, but please only bet. 5% of your Bitcoin. I've seen far too many people. Like I know people that were there right at the beginning and some of them are still in debt. They don't have many Bitcoin, even though they were involved in the highest performing asset class in the, in the, for 10 of the last 12 years. There was two reasons for it. One, um, they saw Bitcoin as a currency, so they had to sell it to meet their living expenses um, and they never got ahead of that curve. And that's a very unfortunate thing to be involved in this. And there's many people that, you know, heartbreaking situation uh, because they just had to keep selling their Bitcoin to meet their rent and they never got ahead of it. So they can never hold it for long enough. Um, and the other is that they just kept gambling on these crazy alternatives. And some people, it worked out. They got incredibly wealthy. You know, with hindsight, you would have invested in a laptop. You would have mined Bitcoin. You would have taken all of your Bitcoin. You would have put all of it in the Ethereum ICO. Um, then you would have taken all of your Ethereum. You put it in Binance token. And then at the end of 2018, you would have put it all in Tether. Um, and then you would have cashed out and put it in, and then bought back Bitcoin in $3,000. Nobody did that. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you could have done that, then you'd be a trillionaire and you'd be competing with Jeff Bezos right now, probably. You know, the, the reality is, is that it's just... I, I, I will never gamble. I, I don't want to be in a position where I end up with in no Bitcoin because I'm trying to gamble on some Bitcoin killer or alternative. But I'm willing to do a bit of speculation around that. And some of those have turned out to be you know, very rewarding and added to my Bitcoin position. Um, so really, what, what, I, what I advise to people is really taking a, a portfolio approach. So 
traditional portfolio theory, you put some in stocks, some in bonds. Stocks are three times riskier than bonds, so you might be overexposed. You know, these types do, of things. Do you use Bitcoin as your, as your um, kind of reserve asset, main asset, or do you use a stable coin when you're thinking of your portfolio, so, portfolio construction to dampen volatility or whatever? So when, how I think about the world, um, I'm, a, I'm about to create a video series on this, but the way I think about the world is we live in a dollar world. Um, if you subscribe to things like dollar milkshake theory and stuff like that, um, then, you know, I have a traditional portfolio. This is, you know, as I've got older, you get more risk adverse. I'm, I turned 40 this year um, and I'm, you know, uh, willing to take, I'm not willing to take as many risks as when I was 30. Um, so I have my traditional bet on what I call my security, which is uh, dollars and dollar denominated assets, a normal portfolio. Um, and I have a hedge against that, which I consider gold. Um, and then I have a hedge against that, which I consider Bitcoin. Um, and with my Bitcoin portfolio, I personally believe that um, you know, I, I see my dollar portfolio as very risky um, because the way that I see it is when we have a 1944 Bretton Woods style scenario, um, we're playing politics and we don't know what the politicians are going to do. So we need to be prepared for inflation, for deflation. They might be able to re-engineer the economy into economic growth or they might destroy the economy and we decide that we need to enter into um, you know, an economic decline in order to correct some of the, the mistakes that have been made in this in this environment we're in today. Um, and so my Bitcoin portfolio has always significantly outperformed my dollar and gold portfolio as long as I've been involved in this industry. Um, and therefore, I rebalance once a year um, to make sure I'm in a position where I just never have to sell in my Bitcoin and I'm covered for um, whatever my expenses are in my dollar portfolio and my security blanket. Um, and then you have your gold hedge and you have your Bitcoin hedge. Uh, but the Bitcoin hedge, the interesting thing is even if the world where you need to earn your money, um, you, need, you can't spend your money and uh, other currencies are getting hyperinflated away, even if we don't enter that world, um, Bitcoin has still outperformed just on the speculation. So when I think of Bitcoin, I see it as gold is a store of value, but Bitcoin's a speculative store of value. Um, and a speculative store of value means that it's not a store of value right now. A store of value is wealth preservation. Uh, Bitcoin makes money, it doesn't preserve money so far. I'm not saying the future equals the past, but that's what it's done so far. And the reason for that is because the majority of the world still think that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, a currency just for drug dealers, um, a scam or a get rich quick scheme. But one by one, every year, thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have discovered that it does more, it's not that. And once the whole world knows it's that, it might be a unit of account and medium of exchange and store of value just like gold. Um, but in the meantime, you get to profit from the differential in people's perception of what Bitcoin is until it becomes what I think it will become. But at the same time, I'm willing to be wrong, which is why I still have the dollar portfolio and the gold portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I think of it as a world where it's a really interesting asset because I think everybody is short calls. The entire investment industry and generally people are short, short the upside. So what happens is as the price rises, they all need to buy back their short position or essentially invest because Currently, it's a, what, $200 billion asset class, right? That's nothing. But if it goes up 5x from here at a trillion dollar asset class, well, guess what? You've now had to suck in all of the asset management firms and certainly all the family offices. And then it goes up to, let's say it goes to 10 trillion, the same as gold. Well, now you've got sovereign wealth funds and you've got, you know, they all have to buy as the price rises because the probability of the eventual outcome goes up with the price. It's a really fascinating dynamic I find with, with uh, Bitcoin, that uh, the more it goes up, the more likely it is to succeed. From my perspective, you know, um, even if you don't believe in Bitcoin, um, I think everyone needs to still follow the Paul Tudor Jones approach, which is they still need 1% or 2% in this. 
Um, and it's irresponsible not doing that. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing that happens from here where if Bitcoin future does equals the past, or even if it's just a tiny fraction of the past, you know, we, we don't need to get another 9 million percent in 10 years. Um, we could just, you know, have something that grows very nicely. Um, but it would be interesting if Paul Tudor Jones's um, hedge fund outperforms all the other hedge funds from here because of that. And therefore, all the other hedge funds have to own some Bitcoin just to try and compete in a market where everyone's comparing their, uh, you know, their, their ROI. Um, and then somewhat, Bitcoin does become an interesting benchmark at that point, um, which is a, it, it's a crazy benchmark to try and beat. Um, but it, it, it's really interesting where we go from here. And I think the really interesting bit gets when um, we start to enter into a more aggressive currency war as we start to enter a more um, interesting monetary renegotiation. So um, in 2016, I, I created a video on how central banks, um, their last monetary policy tool that they have when there's no interest rates, there's no QE, um, is uh, there's no you know monetary policy. The only thing they have left is to actually attack the banks. Um, and by attacking the banks, they can do this by issuing a central bank digital currency. Um, and so if the banks, you know, we reach a phase like we are today. So, you know, people are protesting and rioting in the streets. They're not happy with some of the actions that are being taken. But if we entered into a phase where we had to bail out the banks um, now, I, I don't think the government can do that. I don't think that the, the, the civil um, desire to accept that um, comes again. I don't think they can bail in because that's like saying, you know, this is over uh, for our bank. Um, and I don't think at some stage the credit rating of the Federal Reserve gets called into question. Um, and I think what central banks are going to do is they're going to allow the banks to go bust. So let's say, you know, you have $10,000 at a bank um, and your bank has taken excessive risk and a black swan event exposes the systemic risk in that bank like we saw in 2008. Um, rather than bail them out, I think they can, the central bank can let the bank go bust um, and rather than use the federal deposit, the insurance, um, they can just say to download this digital wallet and we will issue a central bank digital currency in direct proportion to the deposit that you lost at that bank. Um, we'll let that bank go bust. They can auction off all their debt um, and we can let financial technology companies will release an API. We don't want to deal with all the customer service, but we'll release an API where all these financial technology companies can build on top of our central bank um, and they take care of all the customer service. Now, that, that money is not actually either deflationary or inflationary. In fact, what you're doing is you're replacing money that was created as a digital currency at a bank backed by debt, and you're replacing it with debt-free money. The money supply doesn't actually change. Um, all you're doing is you're deleveraging the debt, letting the bank go bust, and governments are actually taking back control of money creation, um, which is a function that most people thought they were performing in the first place. Um, and, you you know, I, I think these are the types of things you're going to see. And so, OK, let's go into that world a bit. So so all money supply is now controlled by central banks through their digital currencies. Uh, you know, it, it looks like it's heading that way because I cannot see the Europeans, the, the UK or the Japanese getting out of their banking issues, just not going away. So it seems like they're going to have to have a day of reckoning some way, shape or form. And you either stick it all in the central bank's balance sheet, or as you say, you figure out a different way, which the digital currencies, Mark Carney's talked about it, Benoit Coray from the ECB have talked about it. So what does that mean? Does that mean now the government or the central bank can allocate capital according to where they think it should go? What system, what world is that? Is it a better world? Is it a worse world? Um, it's a better and worse world, um, depending on what okay. perspective you're analysing. So it's a better world because... Um, Fiat money is still very useful. I, you know, I don't. I'm not one of these Bitcoiners that thinks I want everyone, the entire banking system, to explode. My grandma, my grandfather, my father, my mother, my sister, to all be, you know, reliant upon these few people that own some Bitcoin. 
Um, that's not a pretty world. It's not a nice world, and it's not a desirable outcome. What we do want is we want choice. So we want a financial system where you can opt out, and we want it competing with an alternative financial um, financial system, so that the traditional financial system knows that if we don't do things well, all this money outflows into Bitcoin. That's a really desirable outcome. So what a what a what, what governments, I think, what central banks or governments can do, um, we're not sure if it's going to be one or the other, um, is when they issue their central bank digital currencies, they're going to be very tempted to combine the central bank digital currency with other political agendas. Yeah, fiscal um, policy, because so, you, know, you can give money out immediately and say, well, it should only go to hairdressers in Clacton-on-Sea. You know, it's, it's, they can do anything they want at that point. Well, the the money can be allocated through a peer to peer lending system. You know, you, the government create the money, um, and financial technology companies, new financial institutions, new banks distribute the money. But they're not creating money. You know, they, if they have a hundred percent reserves, they're just lending money that already exists. And so the government needs to have enough money. And it would be a lot easier if you had one money supply called M rather than M0, M1, M2, M4, and, and use interest rates to try and control how much digital currency is created at a private bank, and then implement regulations that they loophole through the investment bank, and then they create these products that they, they just send to sell to your pension um, that you've been contributing to, you know, like we are today. Um, you could have one money supply called M, and it would be really easy to judge a government whether they created inflation and deflation through M. Um, and the you know the the banks can lend out money that actually exists, um, but what I think is the the problem is is that fractional reserve banking was actually a a free market innovation. It was private money being created at a bank. Now there's lots of crony capitalism in it because getting a banking license and an account with the central bank, as we both experienced, is virtually impossible. So it's not a true free market, and the regulations and all that stuff. Um, make it a, a crony capitalism market. Um, but uh, the fractional reserve banking was actually private money. It was the private creation of digital money backed by debt based upon being willing to enter, enter into a loan. At least then, money was one step removed from the government. When you have central banks and banks creating all the money supply, all the digital currency, um, you'll see them tie different policies. So they'll say things like, you know, again, the model is China. China's already done this model with WeChat. Um, you know, they, you give us all of the data to the government, then we'll let WeChat exist. You know, and it happens in the US. We saw from the Snowden revolutions. Facebook, you do all this stiff, with stuff, but we need a backdoor to all the data. Um, and you'll see the same with central bank digital currency. So let's take, a, let's take an example. Um, imagine me and you are engaged in commerce. I'm here on the Isle of Man, you're over there in Cayman Island. We're using Zoom or Skype. Skype is owned by Microsoft. Imagine if we transact in a central bank digital currency. The temptation for the US um, to try and integrate automated tax collection into that central bank digital currency and automated withholding tax and Isle of Man, and, well, obviously Isle of Man and Cayman Island are different, but let's say we were doing between China and Europe with America in the middle. All three of them will want to automate their tax collection into that central bank digital currency. And we enter into a world whereby all of them try and take that piece uh, by code, by, uh, by artificial intelligence. Um, you decide that uh, when you're doing that transaction, um, and then you have to try and get the money back. So you start to, the user experience of money gets worse. Um, because of these different government agendas trying to pay off all their debts and everything they need to do um, in the current uh, world. Then you enter, you exit your house and you decide that you want to get on a plane. Your passport is connected to the digital wallet. Now, let's say you have a lockdown. Um, they force you to download the app in order to get your helicopter money as a stimulus. That's how they get the adoption to the central bank digital currency. Your bank goes bust, so therefore all of that deposit, you have to download the app. In order to get on that plane, you have to have had your vaccine, your compulsory vaccine, so that they are happy with that. Um, it's connected to your passport. Three different governments are trying to automatically, through AI, take withholding tax, and your passport just gets switched off. So the user experience of these central bank digital currencies, what we saw from 9-11 is that you know, anti-money laundering changed the user experience. 
the relationship that we had with money. Um, this virus and this pandemic is changing the relationship we have with privacy because we're opting out of that in order to, you know, laws are being changed to opt out because we want to get, you know, back to normal. Combine those things, anti-money laundering, you know, um, laws ruining, you know, changing the experience of money, privacy just being something we don't um, have, to, we don't care about anymore because of the desperateness of the situation. Couple that with a central bank digital currency, um, we lose, we we enter into currency and money that looks like a communist regime. Uh, we're moving more into a socialist style environment in capitalist economies. It's even worse, though, Simon. I worry about the gamification uh, and behavioural incentives that government, because behavioural economics is one of the big breakthroughs. Because once you've got big data sets, you can basically figure out how to manipulate people. That's what Facebook is. Right, it's the ability to manipulate human emotions via um, understanding what drives those emotions. When you've got an incent a perfect incentive system, which is, a, oh, I'll give you some more digital money if you brush your teeth this morning, if you do that, which China's doing. China's using perverse incentives, which don't work as well as positive behavioral incentives. But what you end up with is a society at first that looks great. Oh, we can stop people destroying the environment or whatever it may be. But then before you know it, different governments, as you say, just keep changing laws and therefore it's total control of people. Yeah. And I'm I'm actually OK with that as long as it's opt in. What I'm not OK with is if you can't opt out of that. Mm. Um, that's where I think we have a really, really scary, scary world. And so why I think Bitcoin is so important is that it regulates the regulators. Um, you know, what we have seen is that if Bitcoin can become something that regulates central banks by saying, if we do really bad things with these central bank digital currencies, we can have capital outflows into Bitcoin. Then, and if a country like, um, you know, someone has destroyed their currency, let's say Venezuela um, or Lithuania, um, if I were advising those governments right now, I'd be saying, take the same asymmetric bet that we are. Look, no one's going to accept your currency for Bitcoin. They're just not. So you've got this useless currency that can't buy any Bitcoin or can't buy anything in the international markets. Um, dedicate some of your electricity to mining Bitcoin. You can, If you can generate your own electricity, um, dedicate some of that to mining Bitcoin. Generate a position and announce at some stage, once you've accumulated enough, that you're hedging some of your dollar reserves, your treasury reserves, your gold that's stored at the Bank of England that you can't access, um, you're hedging it with some Bitcoin. And suddenly you have a game of a game theoretical scenario where the countries are in the worst and worst position and can utilize Bitcoin to make an asymmetric bet. Just the announcement pumps the price, creates countrywide FOMO. Um, and then jurisdictions like Japan that have been, you know, they, Japan's in a really interesting scenario because by all the macro, you know, um, economics, Japan's just this crazy outlier study that people can't quite understand. Um, it invented quantitative easing. You know, it, it did all these crazy things that we, we know today. Um, but Japan has actually, because it was, it was, the country where Mt. Gox, which was the first major scam in crypto exchange, um, and they had uh, other exchanges that have had significant hacks, they got really ahead of this curve. Some of their banks, you know, SBI was investing in Bitcoin mining, invested in many of the companies, this was one of the first banks to invest in this industry. Um, the government put together really aggressive regulations for this industry. When China decided that they're going to not allow crypto exchanges to exist, all of that data went to the South Korean, Japanese, Singapore exchanges. They get all the KYC. They get all the data. Um, they get all the things that they want. And they put together a really good regulatory structure for this industry. So Japan is really ahead of the curve um, in regulating this industry. And what I want, what I'm interested in, is that two-tiered economy. I'm okay with knowing that fiat money is subject to all these problems, but I still need it because it's good for spending. But that's but I've got the opt out. That's a great idea. So Bitcoin acts as the fiscal monetary policeman of the world, right? So you get the chance to vote in or out. The problem is, is what happens with the new digital currency world that it becomes non-fungible? 
with Bitcoin. I mean, there is a risk there that the government goes, whichever government choose, whichever government says, no, it's non-fungible, we'll ban any transaction that exchanges this for that. Well, I guess you, you just have to just go through a couple of other hoops to get there. You exchange it for well, it's, expen- exchange again, it's, it's, your euro token for your Japanese token and then into the cryptocurrency, into Bitcoin or something. Well, we've, we've got case studies for this already. You know, um, gold was made illegal in the U.S., um, for political reasons, um, gold, you know, uh, the U.S. suck up all, the, all that gold. Um, the other countries, um, you have these, you know, premiums in the price of gold in other countries um, when you're trying to suppress the price or, you know, we got we got case studies for this stuff. Now, it's not the same as Bitcoin, obviously. But, uh, gold's got 5,000 years of history and central banks already all owned it. Um, so it's a different story here, which is why the, this asymmetric bet exists. Gold actually also does this in the current fiat system, right? You can opt out and buy gold. We all do it. If we think there's too much uh, monetary largesse, we go and buy gold. So it do- it kind of works already as is. And this is just yeah. the digital version. And that is the interesting part of the digital version because the challenge with gold, and you know, I'm not here to slag off gold. I think I think Bitcoin and gold are, are both very important and they do different things. Um, but the challenge with gold is because you can't store it as easily as Bitcoin um, in your control, you have to give it to a custodian. And so therefore you're subject to the custodian risk. Um, and so, you know, that, that's something that Bitcoin solves. And therefore, you, you know, you need, these are the scenarios where you're going to want some Bitcoin um, and they're hedging against each other. But the scenario where every government around the world coordinates to make Bitcoin illegal I think is an opportunity for another country just to decide that they're going to take all the jobs, they're going to build the economy. It's like with genetic engineering, with all of this stuff, you see it and suddenly Israel and Brazil say, no, it's fine, we'll allow it. So then all of the brain drain goes to those countries and they can start developing stuff. I mean, there's no way. I mean, Russia would just open the door immediately if everyone tried to ban Bitcoin. Russia would just say, no, sure, come and do it here. And we're seeing that already, right? I mean... It's not a desirable outcome if it suddenly becomes a tool that sanctioned countries use. Um, but we're already starting to see that in the traditional currency world. You know, China, uh, Russia, uh, Iran, uh, they're trying to build their bridges that don't rely on the dollar. Um, and so Bitcoin is one of those bridges. Um, and so I, I think that, the yeah, so one government might do it. We, we've seen this, you know, type, we saw this with China. China decided to ban the exchanges. The price of Bitcoin went from $3,000 to $20,000 after China banned it. Um, so it may not do what people think it might do, but I see it quite extreme to have global governments collaborating on making Bitcoin legal because fortunately countries compete and one person making something illegal is an opportunity for another country. You know, um, I, I see it like it, I'm it, behind me, you see the Isle of Man. Um, They were the first country in the world to the government to actually run a Bitcoin conference. I spoke at it in 2014. Um, And right after that conference, they wanted to accept taxes in Bitcoin. I mean, paying taxes in Bitcoin, that's a crazy thing. But if I were the government, I don't want to accept Bitcoin for my tax, for taxes. Um, But uh, they got a call from the Bank of England um, saying, no, we don't really want you doing this. Now, the Isle of Man relies upon... Uh, the digital banking system through clearing through the Bank of England. But the, the Isle of Man already prints its own money. It's got the Manx pound. It creates a paper version of the pound. Um, so it's already got the laws to create its own stable coin. They could just create a, sta- a, a stable coin version. The challenge with that is that they that SWIFT is, you know, if you start doing things like that, then you get blocked out of the international markets. But that's why other use cases are important. Um, to disrupt SWIFT and build these different rails. Um, and that's why this industry is so exciting uh, because you just, you know, it, I, I truly believe that we're alive at one of the most exciting times in financial history, which is going to be absolutely petrifying for some, a ginormous wealth distribution for others. Um, and ignoring this and just um, is why the asymmetric opportunity exists because so many people find it impossible to believe 
that in 10 years, this thing can become statistically significant in the world. But every single year, it's become more and more significant in the world. And it's so anti-fragile. When the banks try to take over Bitcoin, um, I remember I was, I was paid by Jefferies and Bank to go around and present to all the fund managers. Um, just after Blythe Masters was presenting to them all, um, she created the CD, the credit default swap. Um, and she was telling all of the fund managers, no, forget Bitcoin, that's a scam, it's all about blockchain. So the banks then told the whole world, hey, you know, blockchain, forget Bitcoin. You know, they tried to co-opt the word and popularize blockchain. Um, we haven't seen much come out of, we haven't seen anything come out of the banks in the blockchain space, but they all went back, they all went home after the presentation and bought Bitcoin individually. So, you know, the, the fact that this ETF doesn't even exist is, is encouraging ownership by the individuals rather than the funds, rather than it just, and so, you know, the more and more people that actually start to do use Bitcoin the way it was designed, um, the better. Yeah, I mean, a ground up movement has anti-fragility embedded into it because this was a retail revolution. It came from the ground up and not driven by the top down. It's not like here's a new product, it's an ETF, this is how we can make stocks trade simply. This is a really complicated product adopted by millions of people uh, at a broad level. I just think it's super interesting. It's, it's completely the opposite of almost how any other financial product gets adopted. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it, it's the fact that so many people are skeptical about it that makes it so interesting. Um, and, you know, I I, uh, I did a, I know, a, you know, you when you started bringing more and more traditional people into this Bitcoin industry, that's why I really appreciate what you guys have done, because uh, I think it's done a real service for, um, you know, bringing the education to the traditional people, because it is quite unbelievable what, you um, you know what Bitcoin has done in the in the ten in the next ten years, and it's really easy to just think um, that this whole thing can just end, and it's a uh, you know it's it's just a bubble. Um, I'm preparing for that though. You know, again, this is about risk management. Um, it would be a really crying shame if all that Bitcoin did is created this thing called a blockchain and allowed banks to commit more fraud and more crime cheaper through a blockchain. Um, if that's all that came from this, that would just be a real cry and shame. Um, to me, it's the exit from the traditional financial system that's the real use case. Um, and things like DeFi, you know, very, very risky, crazy, hard to things to understand. But the principle of taking every single financial product and replicating it based upon sound money um, is something that I think is is worth seeing if we can make happen. All right. Final question for you. The thing I can't get my head around is derivatives on Bitcoin. Are we just not reinventing the financial system all over again, where it ends up being a levered fractional system? Sure, not at individual banking level, but the whole system ends up being massively levered all over again. I think it's inevitable. Um, I don't think we can change that. I think we see it in the gold market, right? You have physical gold and there's um, all this paper gold. There's not enough physical gold back in that paper gold. Um, I don't think there's a force out there that can change that happening in Bitcoin. But remember, physical gold is not the same as paper gold um, and physical Bitcoin is not the same as paper Bitcoin. Um, and so, yeah, we, we will make the same mistakes again. Um, the industry will do crazy things um, and uh, we're already seeing that right now. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's going to change, but, but, but it still doesn't change the underlying principle that there's only 21 million Bitcoin, despite how many derivatives or paper Bitcoin or all these things are. Um, and there's only 21 million of them that you can own, that you can spend, and that the, whose supply will never change. Fascinating. Simon, listen, thank you ever so much for your time and your thoughts. Uh, really interesting conversation. And let's see where it develops. One day it's going to break this bloody 9200 level that it's just, it's now it's now like a, the volatility of two year notes or something. It uh, doesn't move right now, but sooner or later Bitcoin will start moving again. Yeah, I mean, people criticize Bitcoin when it's in a bubble, they criticize it when it's crashing and they criticize it when it's flat. So uh, <laughs> that doesn't change. <laughs> All right, Simon, thanks ever so much. Good to speak to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.